Before going down the very deep rabbit hole of community plugins in Obsidian, let's make sure we understand what the core plugins can actually do. Let's go. When starting with Obsidian, it's easy to overcomplicate things. There's a lot of flexibility when it comes to customizing it. And of course, there are literally thousands of community plugins just waiting to be explored. But hold on. Before doing so, let's take a moment to understand the core plugins and what they do. This is the goal for today. We will see the first 12 of the 27 core plugins in Obsidian version 167. What they do and how they work. I will go through them in alphabetical order, explain them and show how to use them. This video is the first of two parts, so if you're not a subscriber yet, this might be a good time to change that and get notified when the second part goes live. To make sure that no community plugins interfere, I disabled all of them except for the style settings, simply because I want my customary look and feel rather than the default one. First up, the audio recorder plugin, which does pretty much what you would expect it to do, which is recording audio. Let's take a look. To keep things organized, I created a folder called Audio Recorder, and inside that folder, I added a note Recording 1. Inside that note, we can either press the Start Stop Recording button in the ribbon, or use the command palette via the shortcut Ctrl and P and search for audio. Click or hit the Enter key on the Start Recording Audio command. It almost looks like nothing happened, but if we look closely, we can see that the color of the start stop recording icon has changed. If we click it again, the recording stops. The recording is automatically embedded in the active node wherever our cursor was when we started recording. And if we take a look at our file structure, we can find the actual file under audio recorder slash Z attachments. Why there? Well, if we go to the Obsidian settings and navigate to files and links, we will see that I defined the default location for new attachments to be a subfolder under the current folder. And in the next section, I defined the subfolder name to be Z attachments. Of course, you can adjust this as you wish. Back in the node, we can play the recording, rename it, and generally do what we can do with any attachments. Next, we activate the backlinks plugin. Let's see what happens. As you can see, I already prepared a folder called Backlinks with three nodes called Node 1, Node 2, and Node 3 respectively. Currently, these nodes are not linked. Now, let's add a link from Node 1 to Node 2. And in Node 2, we just mention Node 1, but without linking to it. Okay, now let's go to Settings and turn on the Backlinks plugin. After activating the plugin, we will see the related panel in Obsidian. If the panel does not show up automatically, Open the command palette, enter back and click on show backlinks. This panel will show all the backlinks and unlinked mentions for the currently active node. For node 1, it shows that there are no linked mentions, but there is one unlinked mention in node 2. Well, this seems correct. Remember, we just added the text node 1 without actually linking it. If we now click into node 2, it's the opposite result, of course one linked mention from node 1 and no unlinked ones at all. Of course, the information in the panel updates in real time. Let's add an actual link to node 1 in our node 2. If we now click into node 1, we can see that we have both linked and unlinked mentions from node 2. One more thing. If we go back to settings and click on backlinks, we can activate the option to show backlinks at the bottom of the page. For this to take effect, we need to close and reopen node 1 and node 2. Once this is done, we can find the same information directly inside our node. If you have a lot of links or mentions, you can use these buttons to collapse or expand the results, show more context, sort them, or filter them via a search. Depending on how you organize your nodes, folders might be completely sufficient for you. If not, then the next plugin might be just what you're looking for, bookmarks. So we go to Settings, Core Plugins, and activate the Bookmarks plugin. There are no additional settings for that one, but we could define a hotkey by clicking on the plus icon. Let's quickly do this and define Alt and B for Bookmark as our hotkey for creating a new bookmark. 
The first thing we notice is that we now have a new icon above our left hand pane. Clicking on it shows us all the existing bookmarks, which are exactly none in our case. So let's add some. Once again, I prepared a folder and some sample notes. There are several ways for adding a bookmark. First, we can right click on a note and select bookmark from the context menu. Second, we can use Ctrl and P to open the command palette, search for bookmark and hit enter. And third, we can use the hotkey that we just defined, in our case, Alt and B. Whichever way you prefer, Obsidian will open a small dialog window with the path to the currently active node already filled in. Here we can define a title for the bookmark. This does not have to be the same as the note title. And then we are asked to select the bookmark group. Alas, we do not have any just yet. So we save the bookmark as it is. If we now look at our bookmark pane, we will see it there. We also see these three items. The first one is yet another way to add a bookmark. The second one lets us create bookmark groups. So let's quickly add some. I will just call them group one and group two respectively. And if we then add a new bookmark and click on the bookmark group dropdown, we can choose one of these groups. I will take group one and click save. Of course, we can change our minds and move bookmarks between folders by just dragging and dropping them as we want. Apart from this, we can use the context menu to open the bookmark in a new tab, to the right or in a new window. It also lets us rename and edit the bookmark and reveal the file in the navigation, as well as remove the bookmark. This will not delete the underlying node, of course. The next plugin is a bit more, shall we say, powerful. I'm talking about the Canvas plugin. Once activated, we see that this also has some settings. Let's take a look at those. Here, we can define the default location for new Canvas files as the vault's root folder, the same folder as the current file, or a specific folder. Pick whatever works best for you. For this demo, I will set it to the canvas folder, which I prepared already. Next, we can choose how the mouse wheel should behave by default. It can either pan or zoom. I prefer to set this to pan and use the control key with the mouse wheel for zooming in and out. The next one is interesting and you might need to work a bit with canvas to find which option is the best for you. When clicking and dragging on a canvas, we can select items. With this setting, we can define what shall happen if we use the control key as a modifier while doing that. By default, it will open a menu, asking what you want to do. The menu will present the same options as this dropdown and lets us add a card, an existing node from our vault, media from the vault, a web page, or create a group. Don't worry, we will see all of those in action. Now, if you mostly want to execute just one of these actions, then you can define it here as default behavior. Then we can decide whether the card name should always be visible, only on hover or never. The next two options make it easier to align elements on the canvas. I like to activate both the snap to grid and snap to object setting. And the last setting here is to define the zoom threshold for hiding the card content. Setting a lower threshold will improve performance. Again, you will have to work with it for a bit to find the best value for you. And now let's see the canvas in action. Back in Obsidian, we have two options to create a new canvas. We can right click on a folder and select new canvas, or we can use our old friend, the command palette to do the same. We start by renaming the canvas. At the bottom of the canvas, we can find three icons. We can click on them or drag them on the canvas. The first one will add an empty card. Note that this only exists on the canvas. There is no underlying node or media file in the vault. You can enter any text you like, move and resize the card as you wish. When an element is selected, we can use this little toolbar to delete it, change its color, zoom to it, or edit its content. What we can also do is to right click on a card element and then click on convert to file. This will create an actual node in our vault and convert the card element into a node element on the canvas. The next icon adds an existing node from our vault to the canvas. After clicking or dragging it, we can select which node it shall be. This shows the node's content and gives us the same options as before in terms of positioning, resizing and appearance. However, if we right click on the node, we get some additional options. Most of them are self-evident. Let me quickly highlight a few that are canvas specific. First, we can easily swap the file. So if I like the canvas element size, position and appearance, but want to show a different node, I can do this very quickly. Then we have narrow to heading and narrow to block. This is really useful if you don't want to see the top of your node's content, but a specific part. For example, we can narrow to the heading, heading two in this node, 
And then we see this paragraph on the canvas. Narrow to block does the same, but works with any block in a node, not just with headings. So I could focus on this line in my node and make the canvas look cleaner. If you want to show the entire file again, just click on narrow to heading again and then select show entire file from the dialog box. And the third icon down here lets us add media from our vault. We still have our audio recording from earlier, so let's just use that one. If we right click on the canvas, we get the same three options for adding elements to it, but we also get two more element types. We can add a web page, which then gets loaded into this element on our canvas and can even be used pretty much as in a browser window. And the last element type we can add to a canvas is a group. Let's add a few of those. One is called downloadables, another one can be documentation, and a third one could be videos. By the way, a super fast way to duplicate elements is to just hold the control key and drag them over. Let's play around a bit. I will move some elements, format them, and generally just build a quick overview of lean productivity resources and how they are connected. This reminds me, it's really simple to create flow diagrams or just show relationships between elements. Just hover over an element, grab a node, and drag it to another element's node. If you drag it into open space, Obsidian will ask you what element to create and then connect to it automatically. As you can see, the Obsidian canvas is very versatile and can be used for a multitude of purposes. The next core plugin is one that we have been using already, the command palette. Of course, this has been enabled since the beginning. We also saw already that there is a hotkey assigned to opening the command palette. By default, this is Control and P, but you can change this, of course. In the plugin settings, we have the option to pin commands. Let's say we often need to move our current node to another folder. Then we can go here, search for move current and select move current file to another folder to be pinned. If we then open the command palette back in Obsidian while we have a node open, we will see this command at the top of the list and don't have to search for it. Apart from that, the command palette is our gateway to any and all functionality inside of Obsidian. Whenever you don't know how to do something, Try the command palette first. Moving on, we are now at the daily notes plugin. As the name suggests, it helps us with creating a daily note. Let's see how this works. After activating the plugin, we click on the little gear icon to get to its settings. These are very straightforward. We can define our preferred date format, for me the default is fine, which will be used for naming the daily notes. Then we can choose a default folder to create the daily notes in. I already prepared a folder called daily notes. So I just pick that one. If we don't want our daily note to be empty right after creating it, we can also prepare a template with our preferred structure and functionality. Once again, I prepared that. So I select the TPL daily note file from the folder 99 templates. And the last setting here tells Obsidian to automatically open or if it does not exist, create the daily note at startup. Personally, I prefer to have this turned off. With the settings all done, let's see it in action. First, here is our template. As you can see, it is very basic with just a few properties for tracking habits, sleep quality, and the mood on the day. In the notes body, the template should automatically add the notes title, that is the date, as a heading one. Under that, we prepared some space for thoughts of the day and preparation for the next day. As you can see, we have no daily notes in our folder just yet. To create a new one, we can click on the icon in the ribbon on the left hand side. It says open today's daily note. And if it does not exist yet, it will create it for us. And this seems to work just fine. The note is in a daily notes folder. The name is today's date. The template was applied correctly and we can start adding content. Of course, we can also create or open the daily note via the command palette. Open it once again with control and P search for daily and hit enter. Different way, same result. I often read posts online where people ask about restoring accidentally deleted or lost files. Amazingly, a lot of people don't seem to be aware of the next core plugin, file recovery. Let's change that. We activate the plugin and take a look at its settings. Contrary to most other plugins, this is also where we use the plugin. First, we define how often a snapshot shall be taken at least. 
By default, this is a minimum interval of five minutes. We can also define for how long the snapshot of a file shall be kept. The default value here is seven days. We can see these snapshots by clicking on view. And here we can also select one to be restored. And if we want to get rid of all of them, we can simply use the clear button to delete them. The files core plugin comes next and is another one that I had activated from the beginning simply because it made showing how the various plugins work so much easier. What it does is to provide this tree navigation in the left hand pane of Obsidian. We can also move it to the other side, but by default it's here. I think the functionality and how to use it is quite clear. You have seen how I created new nodes and folders, how they can easily be moved around via drag and drop and that we can interact with them by right-clicking and using the context menu. The context menu itself offers some typical file management options, like opening, copying, moving and renaming the files. But there are also some Obsidian-specific items. These include setting a bookmark, we saw that already, and copying the Obsidian URL of an item. With this Obsidian URL, we can create shortcuts outside of Obsidian linking directly to the respective item. Let me quickly show you how that works. Let's get the Obsidian URL of our node 1 under backlinks. I copy it and, since I'm working on a Windows PC, go to my Windows Explorer, right-click and select New Shortcut. I paste the Obsidian URL, give it a name and click Save. Once this is done, I can double-click it and it will open that node directly in Obsidian. This can come in very handy if you have multiple vaults and you want to open those directly via the shortcut on your desktop or even via the pin in your taskbar. Obsidian comes with a core plugin that can help you convert nodes from other tools or systems. This is the Format Converter plugin. As always, we activate the plugin and this one does not come with any settings to configure. So let's jump right into it. We go back to Obsidian where we notice a new icon in the ribbon. We can click on it or use the command palette to start the Format Converter plugin. And when we do that, we get this dialog. Here we have some options for converting nodes. We also see a warning that whatever we do here will be applied to all our nodes, not just the one that is currently open. Needless to say, we want to be very careful with that and probably make a backup of our vault before playing around with this plugin. We have a total of six conversion helpers all of which operate on the assumption that the nodes already exist in our vault. In other words, this plugin does not help with importing nodes from tools such as Notion, Evernote or OneNote. For that, like for so many other things, there is a community plugin. The first three items help with converting the markdown from Rome nodes. The format converter can fix the syntax for tags, highlights and to-dos. If you have bare nodes, the Format Converter can help you with fixing the highlights. And for your Zettelkasten, and yes, it is Zettelkasten, not Zettelkasten. This is one advantage of being a native German speaker. It can fix the link syntax and also make the links look nicer by hiding the UID and only showing the actual file name. The next one is a funny one. I believe it is one of the most discussed and most visible plugins. At the same time, many people doubt its usefulness. I'm of course talking about the Graph View plugin. For many people, especially those who are not using Obsidian just yet, the Graph View is probably one of the first things they associate with Obsidian. And I get it, it can look nice. Here's the one from my own vault. But I also agree that this view is not very useful for working with my notes. Fortunately, there is more. So let's activate the Graph View plugin. There are no plugin settings. Any customization of the graph will be done later in the actual view itself. Once again, we see a new icon in our ribbon for opening the global graph. But before we look at that in detail, let's open node one from our backlinks folder. Now we hit Control P, search for graph view and see there is an open local graph option. We hit this in the new tab with graphical representation of only the current nodes connections is displayed. Let's move this to the right hand panel. Here we can keep it open and whenever we open a node, it will update automatically. The same is true for adding new connections. Let's link to bookmark 3 and there you go, the connection is shown. Now for this local graph, I find it useful to go to the graph view settings and activate the arrows option 
to see in which directions the links go. We will look at the other settings in a moment when we get to the global graph view. Because I don't have many nodes in a demo world, I switched to my production world for this. And this is how my graph looks like. Just like the local graph, the global view shows connections between nodes, but instead for a single one, it shows it for all of them. Or at least for all of those matching our filter criteria. And the filters are already the first thing we will look at. What we see here immediately is a search box. Here we have multiple options to filter our graph view. For example, we could show only nodes that are in the path 01 projects. If we want to narrow it down even more, we can add a tag filter for items with the tag YouTube. Every time we apply a filter, the graph view updates immediately. But we can not only create additive filters, we can also turn it around and filter for all items under 01 projects, except those with the tag YouTube, by simply adding a minus before the tag filter. As you can see, apart from path and tags, the list of search filters includes file name, line, section, and property. The principle is always the same and they can all be combined as shown before. Then we find four toggles that we can use to filter the results. If we enable the tags toggle, Obsidian will automatically add tag nodes to the view and link to all the items with the respective tag. For example, you can now see this node called hashtag Obsidian and if we disable it, it's gone again. Next, we can toggle the visibility of attachments in our graph. If this is off, only actual nodes, that means .md files, will be shown. If we turn it on, all file types will be displayed. If you're like me, you often create links to nodes that don't exist just yet. By default, Obsidian recognizes these links and shows even the non-existent nodes in the graph view. We can change this by toggling the existing files only filter. Let me do this a few times so you can see how the graph view changes. The next filter deals with the opposite of linked but not existing nodes. It helps us to hide or show orphans. Orphans are nodes in our vault that are not linked to any other node. Again, I will toggle this a few times to show the difference. Looks a bit like an asteroid belt around the solar system. You may have noticed that my graph view is more colorful than the default graphs usually are. We can achieve this by using the groups feed. Here we can define rules for coloring the nodes in the graph view. Here are the ones that I am using at the moment. Of course, there is no right or wrong way for that. Like so many other things in Obsidian, it depends on your needs and preferences. In my case, most definitions are based on tags and some are based on paths. I have one here where I combine tag and path. As before with the search filter, we simply have a lot of flexibility here. If you have watched some of my other videos or used any of my vaults, you will know that I always have a folder called 90 organize for anything that are not actual nodes. I put there my templates, dashboards, queries, etc. While I want to see those in my graph, they are not the most important things. So I use a group rule to change their color to a dark gray. Let's change the color for a moment to see how easy and fast this works. I just click on the color dot next to the rule, pick or enter a new color and hit enter. And right away, the graph view is updated accordingly. An important note here. If you have items in your vault that are affected by multiple rules, only the first rule will be applied. So if I add a new rule here for all the items in my 90 organized folder to be shown in a different color, this will be ignored. In the display section, we meet the arrow toggle again. We last saw that on the local graph view. It does the same here as it did there. If I zoom in a bit and toggle it on, you can actually see the arrows indicating the link direction. As useful as I find this with the local graph for an individual node, I really don't see much value in having this turned on for the global graph. But again, if it helps you, go for it. With the slider for the text fade threshold, we can control the visibility of our node titles in the graph. If we turn this all the way down, the graph gets completely overwhelmed with text and we need to zoom in a bit to actually see individual nodes and connections properly. If we move it to the other end of the scale, the titles would only show up when we zoom in very much. The last two sliders here let us adjust the size of our nodes and the thickness of the lines between them. As always, you will probably have to play around with all three sliders to find the best settings for your respective use case and personal preference. In this section, we also find the button Animate. If we click on it, the graph view will be recreated showing the nodes as they were added over time. In my case, this takes about a minute, 
so I accelerated this a bit for the video. In the last section, we find four sliders that let us control the alignment of nodes in the graph by combining the center force, repel force, link force, and link distance, we can make the graph look the way we want. Personally, I like to be able to easily identify clusters. So I tend to increase the link force and decrease the link distance to get linked items closer to each other. Once again, this is pure personal preference and no right or wrong way in general. The Node Composer plugin helps with, you guessed it, composing nodes by extracting text from the current node into a new one. Here is how that works. As always, after activating the plugin, we check its settings. For the Node Composer plugin, there are only three. First, we can choose what should happen in the current node after extracting text to a new one. The plugin can automatically place a link to the new file, embed the new file, or simply do nothing. We will keep the default setting of link to new file. If you want to use a template for extracting text, you can specify that here. I prepared a template, which we will see in a moment, called TPL Composer. The last option controls whether we shall get a warning when merging files or not. Default is on and we keep it that way. Here is the prepared template. I kept it very simple and used the date and from variables to fill the front matter fields. In the node itself, I want the title to be a heading one and after a heading two, I just insert the extracted content. Let's go to node two under backlinks. I will highlight the second paragraph, hit Ctrl and P to open a command palette, and search for Composer. This gives us three options. We start with Extract this heading. If we click this, the plugin will ask which heading to extract. I select heading 2, and the new node will be created in the root of our vault. Let me open these nodes side by side. Here we see that the new node automatically got the heading 2 text as its name. The front matter was filled with the current date, and the name of the originating node. Additionally, the node content was filled in and we have a link in the original node to the newly created one. So this works pretty much as expected. Now let's take node 3, highlight this paragraph, open the command palette again and select extract current selection. This time I want to enter my own title. I could have done the same before and call it selection. Once again, the template is used to create a new node in the root directory. The front matter is filled in Node content is also there, and the link from the originating node to the new one is also entered. We click into the Heading 2 node, open the command palette, search for Merge, and click on Merge Current File with another file. The plugin asks us which file to merge with, and we pick the Selection node. As configured in the plugin settings, we get a warning about the Heading 2 node being deleted. We confirm this and see that the Heading 2 node content gets appended to the content of the selection node. This is quite useful for splitting up long nodes into shorter ones or merging atomic nodes into a single document. The next plugin is Outgoing Links, and there's really not too much to say about it, so I will keep it short. We just activate it. There are no settings for this plugin, and should see a new icon above the right hand pane in Obsidian. If this looks familiar, that's because it is the same as the icon for backlinks, but with the arrow pointing the other way. And that's no coincidence. Outgoing links does exactly what we would expect. It shows us all the links from the currently active node to any other nodes. You could say that this is redundant with the local graph view, and you would not be wrong. Again, it depends on whether you prefer lists or a visual representation. This is as far as we go in this first part. I cover all the remaining core plugins in the next one, so you will have a full overview of all of them. As you can see, Obsidian and its core plugins are very powerful all by themselves. Depending on your needs, you might still want to add community plugins. I sure did so myself. My only advice is to think twice before doing so. Otherwise, you might easily find yourself spending, or rather wasting, a lot of time on learning and customizing a plugin rather than using Obsidian productively. Again, I'm speaking from experience here. Detailed documentation for each Obsidian Core plugin can be found on the official Obsidian help page. I left the link in the description for you. I really hope this helped you understand Obsidian's Core plugins better, and if so, perhaps drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell to make sure you won't miss the next videos. And if you could share it with whoever might be interested, that would be great too. If you need help or have any questions, the YouTube comments might not be the easiest way to interact with each other. Alternatively, you can find me on your preferred social media platform. 
you can find all the links to my profiles in the description as well. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.